I got saved at 14, I'm 84, almost 85. So I've been 70 years, I've seen all kinds of tragedies in the church, wars and rumors of wars, popular men going popular and so forth. But keep looking unto Jesus and reading the word and remembering these old paths that my daddy used to talk about so much and all the other looks like trivia. Well, I've often said that uh, I didn't come to Jesus as, as an old English hymn like we used to sing so often. I came to Jesus, I was weary and worn and sad. I didn't because I was 14 and uh, I didn't understand my father's zeal for God. I didn't come because I was convicted of sin. I came because of the blanks in my life, like he relished reading the word of God and he relished going to prayer meetings, even half nights of prayer. And also, more than ever, he relished being a street corner preacher. And that, uh, do you remember the hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, Thou Lamb of Calvary? Well, the last stanza says, May thy rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart, my zeal inspire. And my daddy had inspired zeal. God lifted the beggar from the dunghill. He completely changed my daddy. He'd been to a certain system of religion which made him fearful and... Uh, terrified of priestcraft and all that and he got marvelously born again as a result of hearing uh, David Matthews who went through the Welsh Revival then he wrote the classic it's still a classic on I saw the Welsh Revival and well, my daddy had never been in meetings like that and the fervor and the joy uh, the, particularly I remember seeing David Matthews when I was five years of age I'd never seen anybody preach like he sang like his mouth like an oval and he had a shock of black wavy hair and he had a zeal and he had a joy in the Lord that stirred and my daddy got saved well as a result of that as I say he became fervent in spirit serving the Lord I never saw him downcast I never saw him uh, suggesting about giving up but I mean when he got saved he, he tossed away his interest in professional football and everything else which, which of course became a, a style in England after you're saved you never go to a movie, you never go to a professional match there's so much profanity and so forth and when I saw that and I saw the joy and we lived in comparative poverty we had much money, my daddy was a laborer and as a result of that as I say at 14 he took me to a half night of prayer there were three other men there and they prayed and my daddy was a big husky man taking his coat off at one o'clock in the morning in a room that had no heat and praying with tears and fervor. From that very day, I recognized as something far beyond what the average Christian had. And then after that, of course, I went to the Methodist class meeting till I was 14 and that was full of the joy Lord. And uh, I mean, people spoke as though God lived with them all the time and he did. And there was that same kind of zeal there. I mean, even in those days, back in the 19, uh, well, that would be around 1912, just before World War I even, uh, there was a half hour song singing before the Sunday night service, but they didn't sing choruses, except choruses from hymns. Or they sang great hymns like, And Can It Be, and so forth. And he had men who would explode in a meeting when he was singing, And Can It Be, that I said, My chains fell off, an old boy would jump, and the tears rolled down his face, he'd strike it up at the end. There's a woman to the left of us. I used to watch her because her neck would go red and then she'd suddenly burst with a hallelujah, you know. We talk about the joy of the Lord. I've never seen anything like it. Well, at that time, Samuel Chadwick was preaching in the... He had revival on the local level in Leeds. And, of course, the conversation in our house, we hardly ever had a newspaper. There's no talk about films, of course, which were just coming out then. It was all about God and missionaries and so forth. Daddy took me to see Padgett Wilkes, who founded the Japan Rescue Mission. I was about uh, 12, I think. I heard C.T. stood give a lecture one morning. And uh, later saw Miss Cable and Miss Francesca French that walked through China and the Gobi Desert and all that kind of... My daddy, wherever there was uh, anything further, I'll tell you, at that <coughs> time... Doncaster was 25 miles away from us. Well, um, 
there's a Pentecostal fellowship there, and I forget the name of the Bible teacher, but my dad might have get on a bus to town, another bus from town to Doncaster, and then walk the rest of the way to the fellowship and stay there a weekend and come back radiant as though he'd been in the upper room, which he just about had, because um, Smith Wigglesworth was one of the teachers there, and all those guys, and, uh, and nobody in those days scornfully said, said <coughs> faith healing is fake healing. I mean, there were living evidences of people spontaneously getting out of wheelchairs and so forth, but it wasn't that. Merely it was a transformation in personality. I mean, they went back to the churches and had prayer meetings, and uh, in our town, we had a little man who's only... Uh, I don't think he weighed above uh, about 110 pounds. And for years he fasted and prayed. He was a Pentecostal which was despised. In fact, his wife said to hear him pray, he'd be praying in another room. It was like, you know, a man having a personal encounter with God. He'd wrestled with God. Well, then George Jeffries came along in 1927. The whole city was swept in three weeks with the Holy Ghost. And the church in, in, is there today. It's called Bridge Street in Leeds, England. That church is still, it's in its third enlargement. When other churches are going down, they still have that same. They were born in the fire, they maintain the fire, but they maintain prayer all the time. Well, then from there, uh, I was in a factory, working in a factory one day, and I heard a voice say, follow me, and I turned, it was so real. I took my tape off my neck, I was a tailor's cutter, put my shears down and pray, and I remember saying clearly to the Lord, Lord, not only will I not go back, I won't even look back. And that day I applied to go to Cliff College, and then went, Chadwick was the principal there. Well, Chad, the birds both had a flock together. So, the great character in America at that time was A.B. Simpson, founder of Christian Mission Alliance. And also in Scotland, there was a man by the name of... Uh, McIntyre, don't you, have you read his little book, Hidden Life of Prayer? It's one of the classics. It's still published, Bethany just republished. Well, well, those three men, you, of course, across the Atlantic, there was no telephone in those days, and mail was slow, but they corresponded all the time because they're all on one level. Well, Chadwick went out, and right opposite his church in the middle of Leeds, there's an oversized statue of, uh, of Queen Victoria, with a big spread in front of it, and men used to stand on there and preach. Well, an atheist stood there, and he laughed at people coming out of church and scorned them and told you, yeah, man, stand in a coward's castle, a pulpit, he talks one way, you can't answer. listen to me, and they listen. Well, Chadwick went out and listened to this man scorning the Bible and everything, and one day he said, listen, I've listened to you three weeks, you dead, and come and listen to me. You come and listen to me, so I come next. So he came, and there's a big horseshoe gallery, and right opposite the preacher was a clock, and this man, the leader, sat behind the clock, and the other ten men sat with him, and they came to the altar the first night they were there, and it wiped out the whole testimony of the atheists. And then it wiped out the, all the devilry in the community at level on a, on a, on a local state, uh, revival on a le local st level. And it was all prayer. I mean, he wrote, the, he wrote the book, The Way to Pentecost, and after that he wrote the book, The Path of Prayer. And that's where he lived, and that's where... It rubbed on, on, off on so many of us that we we saw a living example of a man who walked in the power of the Spirit. Well, then, I could go on for long enough, but I won't. Uh, all the time I've tried to feed myself, and I've gathered books, I've a rack of books on prayer, and uh, a whole stack of books on historic revival, which we don't have anymore. America hasn't had a revival in the last 70 years that I know of. I mean, revival that closes the shops and as soon as people get home, they want to get to the sanctuary, and, and they don't stay till 7 o'clock till 8, they still 8 till midnight and after, when the Holy Ghost really comes. I think very often we're praying in ignorance, we want the Holy Spirit to come, but what do we want Him to come for? Just to increase our numbers, just so our kids won't go to the devil. I mean, are we jealous for God's glory? And to me, that's what revival's all about. Revival is an invasion of God by the Spirit. And if we, America doesn't have one in the next ten years, it's going to be horrible living in this country. Crime is out of hand now. Immorality abounds, herpes, AIDS, every devilish thing is prospering. 
plus all the power of the cult, say, multi-million dollars. So it's inevitable that we have revival. Paul said, Would to God you could bear with me in my folly. Yeah. Indeed, bear with me, for I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. Yeah. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, yeah. whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, yeah. you might well bear with him. Yeah. Is there another gospel that we're listening to? It's not sure. the gospel. What is that gospel? Well, in England we used to call it modernism, or you call it liberalism here, that... Uh, I mean, the Baptists now, for a long time, they've had contention about the, the Bible, is it the very word of God? I mean, uh, can't we alter it? And as I say very often, we've revised it, but God never has. And I still think the King James Version is nearest to the best. And those old-fashioned guys preach it. I think, brother, this, we've almost no preachers in America. Everybody's teaching, teaching, teaching. I think I have 500 tapes in there that people, I think I got 40 tapes in the first month of this year. You must read my interpretation of Revelation. You must read my story. There is, there's, a, there's at least 50 John the Baptists in the country, so they think they are. If a guy tells me I'm John the Baptist, I say, have you increased your insurance? I say, why? I say, you're only going to live six months. He goes, oh, no, no, no. But we're not preaching the gospel. What are we preaching? Well, there's one, there was two groups. There's one group now that's preaching signs and wonders all the time. There's another one that says it's love and signs. And, if it's signs and wonders in God's name, what did he do for Judas? He saw everything Jesus did, then look what he did. And what are some of the guys that have been preaching about the Holy Ghost and miracles? Where are they now? One's in jail, the other's in the gutter, comparatively. We've got to get back to the cross. I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. You get the Emmaus Road, going down the Emmaus Road, it says that Jesus opened unto them the Scriptures, then they opened their eyes, then they opened their understanding. But then, you'd think after they'd... And read the last chapter in Luke, and it says the most awesome thing there, that they sat and talked with Jesus and had breakfast with Him. One of them broke bread and he took, gave Him bread. The other one broke a honeycomb. And, well, can you imagine you giving Jesus personally honeycomb and he puts his hand out, there's a nail a hole through it? And they saw the most astounding miracle in history, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And wait a minute, he says, come with me. And they went to what they saw, the next most astounding miracle, the ascension of Jesus into heaven. Couldn't they live on that? Couldn't they live? live? There isn't a devil in hell will ever move us. We had breakfast with Jesus. We talked with Jesus. We shared a meal with Jesus. Couldn't you live on that forever? Jesus says, no, you can't. Well, we saw him ascend into heaven, not many of us, but we saw him. The two most outstanding things, and yet Jesus has tarried till he be endued. You can't live on the emotion of it. That's the trouble with the, the most horrible thing I know that happens in evangelism today. We don't value the human soul. When are we going to get serious about being serious about the most serious thing in the world, the birth of people at the altar? I watched the close of a service in Dallas a few weeks ago. At the end, about 15 people came in four, four minutes. They said a prayer and gone away. Well, the, my reaction to that, brother, was this. I can't get my car through a car wash in four minutes. Can they pass from death unto life? Can they put off the old man and put on the new man, as you use the figure? Can they get married to Christ in four minutes? Of course not. In fact, when you read uh, Seven Pentecostal Pioneers, which everybody should read because it's still printed, it tells you there that they had one place where they had meetings for th three weeks, and I forget the number, something like 964 people came and everyone was dealt with personally. We used to go to a city without money and pitch a tent and stay there 12 weeks. The churches are still there 60 years after. But everybody came to the altar. If you came, I come with a Bible at the side of you and ask you what your problem was. You wanted to be saved, we took you through the scriptures. If we spent an hour, so what? 
I, say, I don't often watch TV. I watched a special, there was a special about three years ago, uh, of all the things we were going to show on one of the, uh, what, what are you called now? <coughs> well, it was a special on animals, the birth of a giraffe. Now I said to Martha, well, darling, I want to see this. So anyhow, the guy said, now listen, I've already gone through this once, but let me show you. And he brought in this this female, he said, look, her head is 14 feet from the ground, which I thought was a long way. Now here's the male, his head is 19 feet from the ground, now watch. And he said, I've been through this, so watch. And he said, we bring the camera right in front of the giraffe. And he said, now look, she's spreading her legs at the back. And you see that black thing hanging? That's a little baby, and it's going to fall five to six feet, according to the height of the animal, onto a bed of straw. So what's that got to do with the gospel? It broke my heart. Why? Because I watched that thing. And he said, now watch the neck. Now you see the thing's coming. Now, now watch, watch. He said, there. And the thing dropped to the, onto, the, onto the big bed of straw. And he said, now this takes between three and four hours. And he said, now watch. And the little thing tried to get up and it rolled over. It tried again, it rolled over. It tried up again, it rolled the other way. Now watch carefully, he said. And the next time it tried, the mother put her hoof behind its, its backside and lifted it up and it stood up and she turned around and nodded and the little thing nodded and he said that's almost four hours so I ran into the room to pray and mother said what's wrong? I said darling I said it takes four hours to get a baby giraffe born it doesn't take four minutes for somebody to get born at our altars today oh well I, Graham said it more than once just stay a few minutes stay a few minutes in God's name what do you mean stay a few minutes? Was Gethsemane a few minutes? Was the temptation in the wilderness a few minutes? We're trying to get people, I guarantee that not 5% of people in America or England are genuinely born again of the Spirit. They're born again of a decision, they give up a few lousy habits, some of them, and some of them don't, they go right back. And then you tell you there's nothing in it. Dear brother, I, I was at a certain place, I preached on a new birth, I thought there was a pretty much liberty. and. A, a, I said, if any of you want this experience of birth in Christ, come forward. The men come down the aisle and go to the room on the right. Women go down on the left. So there were about half a dozen in each group. Well, that was that was uh, nine o'clock, and we stayed in that room till ten, helping men, and they were really broken before God. Then at ten o'clock, there was a knock on the door, and I said, "Come in," and it was the pastor. And he said, "Can I bring this lady in? Will you pray with her?" I said, "Well, if you stay, she's a big." gorgeous looking blonde, she no sooner hit the ground than she burst it and she said, I want to tell you something, Mr. Raymond. I said, well, tell me, I'll listen. She said, this is the 14th time I've come out for this. I went to a certain Bible school for three years. We had three revivals a year and each time I went, that was nine times. And he said, since then I've been to other meetings. Somebody slips her arm around me and says, don't worry, dear, Jesus paid it all. He knows when you said you're sorry that that's all that matters. And I said, that's not true. And I said, that we'll stay with you while you really get a real relationship with God. So we stayed. And she passed from death to life. How do I know? Because two years after I was passing the church, she was coming out with a Bible. And I said to her, fellow, he said, that's the good woman you prayed for the last time you were here. She's the best Bible teacher we have, but the thing was, before she got saved, and back to Bible school day, she got married, she got divorced, she had a child, she had a broken heart, a broken life. It would have been avoided if she got saved the first time. But she didn't get saved. She made a mental decision. She wanted to be better. She wanted to go to heaven. But how many people really want to know? I mean, isn't the essence of Christianity Christ in you, the hope of glory? There's no other religion in the world where a man's God comes and lives inside of him. And we've made it appear as though if you get saved, of course, you're going to give up all your joys, you give up these crazy habits, you don't go to movies, you don't go to ball games, you, Christ is all you want. But what on the other hand, what about peace that passes all understanding? What about a home eternal in the heavens? What about the eternal aspect? We don't present that. I got, I got two fellows in here the other week, and they came from a certain, well, actually came from Criswell Seminary. And one of them said immediately, said, Mr. Rennie, I know to put a sermon together, I know to get words together, but I have no power. The other man burst into it. I said, I just opened a, 
a paper and you, your picture's in there. He said, well, I didn't put it. Somewhere. I said, but you're a preacher. He said, I've had 300 people saved in the last three months. I said, how do you know? And he hadn't an answer. Well, he said, I don't know. I've often wondered. They'll come out and say a prayer and go out and live the same. I said, they don't. If they're born again, you become a new creature. If any man, anywhere, at any time, be in Christ. And there's no better example of that than Dave Wilkerson with all the people he covers. Unless, I don't know if you know Jackie Pulling, do you know Jackie? Well, she was here to see me. And I mean, she goes, to, she doesn't go out till 10 o'clock at night. She goes to the gutter, she goes to the outcast. She goes to the prostitute, she goes to men that have smoked opium for 50 years. She goes to women that have prostituted for 40 years. You've got to have a gospel. You can't give a mental flip to those people. And she stays with them until they're born again of the Spirit of God. As one of the most amazing works in the world as far as I'm concerned. But where are the people? I mean, you add up all the people who made a profession of Christ in the last few years of our crusades, or let me put it here and then quit. I had a, a veteran missionary from South America, and he said, before I came up with the rain, I was talking to a veteran missionary, and he said, Brother, if you add up all the crusades in South America, and all the people, everybody in South America has been saved five times in the last 15 years. Well, is it the same in this country? Or we talk about how many people came to the meeting, how many people came forward. Why aren't the churches increasing? I had a lawyer call me from one of the greatest churches in the country, said, Mr. Amber, at least a thousand people walk down the aisle in our church every year. And after three years of doing that, he said the church is still the same size, we still have the same seating capacity, the prayer meetings haven't grown, there's no evidence except that these people come forward every Sunday. Why aren't they? As I said to you earlier, dear brother, the darkness of this day is the gift of the church to the world. The street meetings have gone. Dear God, we have all kinds of ministries around here, but Tyler goes to hell. How many churches do you have in mega churches in Dallas? I guess you can't find one street. I spent 50 years of my life in street meetings. Every Saturday night I went out at 9.30 till midnight and after. Every night, for, whether it was snowing or raining or what, we went out to the same place and people came out of taverns and out of movie houses at 10 o'clock and stayed an hour and two hours in the cold. No air-conditioned buildings. No nice, no attractive singers. Just testament that I, I call a one man said this man was in jail. This man used to run around with women. This man has a prison record. This man over there used to beat his wife and the transfer. This girl was a prostitute and put them up, living flesh and blood. Nobody could argue. People would stand and say, why are you the only preacher in the town does this? I don't know except God told me to do it and I do it. Well, that's where the lost people are. A man would be an idiot to buy a hundred dollar fishing gear and fish in his bathtub. And that's all we do in church. We're fishing with the same people every week. And people are dying without God. I'm glad, dear brother, I was raised in a church where we had a... I know the preacher's often boring. I devoured the Methodist hymn book 80 years ago, and I can recite still dozens and dozens of hymns. And one was a hymn by Andrew Bonner, Go labor on, spend and be spent, thy judge do the master's will. It is the way the master went, should not the servant uh, tread it still. Men die in darkness at your side without a hope to cheer the tomb. Take up the torch and wave it wide, the torch that lights times thickest gloom. I go to the prayer meeting, somebody will pray that. After that, somebody will pray the, the prayer of one of the greatest of modern women there um, from India. Um, what was her name? Amy Carmichael. Uh, yeah, thank you, Amy Carmichael. You know, Give me a love that leads the way of faith which nothing can dismay, a hope, no disappointments, tired a passion that will burn light. Let me not sink to be a clod, the woman didn't weigh over a hundred pounds. Make me thy fuel flame of God. She never married, she took a one-way ticket to the mission field. People go now, there's plenty of money in our church, oh we'd love you to come back for Christmas or Thanksgiving, do come back. So they break off and come back, they go back, they run to and fro. They have to go with a camera, they have to go with a load of stuff. You don't find the old-fashioned missionaries going like they used to do. Jackie went on a single ticket to Hong Kong when she was 19. She's 44 now. She's still there. She's shed a million tears. 
But she's had some of the greatest characters, infamous characters, saved there. How many people come forward in your church and you can go back afterwards and say, you, well, you came to the altar like, well, what happened in your life? I think that everybody that comes to the altar, we should visit them during the week and be sure that they did pass from death unto life because what happens? They say, well, I've been out twice and never got anything. Well, they can't because what to do so mentally. I don't see any brokenness. I see kids come forward in a, in a crusade, they're laughing and joining hands, they go out and the first thing they do is stop at a, um, a hot dog place or something. They don't go home to grieve and read the word and find out if it's true. They go back full of jollity and they sing on the bus and we had a wonderful time. But what are we doing? The summer's gone. The harvest is past. The harvest is past. And we're not saved. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, I'm saying, dear brother, I don't believe that we, we, we reach the conscience like some people, like uh, one of the classic things Dr. Tozer used to quote to me often. He used to say, well, Len, remember when our famous American preacher D.L. Moody went to London, the first day he preached, they laughed at his, his Yankee clothes. The second day, they laughed at his style. The third day, York Cambridge University men were there laughing and he stopped them. He said, gentlemen, laugh at my style, laugh at my Americanism. But he said, in God's name, don't laugh at the word of God. He says, the word that I would just as soon handle uh, fork lightning. But what happened? Here's an illiterate man, he, comparatively no education. He goes to London. He goes from London to Scotland where Alexander White was the king of the pulpit at that time. And Alexander White sits on the edge of his head with his mouth open. Well, what, what has this man got? He doesn't know history too well, doesn't quote scripture very correctly, but there's something about him. So much so that across town, there's a man, I don't know if you have a book called uh, Noah Book, written by Henry Drummond, the greatest thing in the world. It was one of the greatest classics ever. And Alexander White says to Drummond, hey, come over and hear this fellow. We haven't done any fans who was like this. And they were spellbound. What would have happened if he'd gone to London for three days? He didn't. He went for eight months. He went to Scotland, and, and, and there's still the, uh, the tent hall is still there. I, I think they call it a tent hall because people came out of the tent that Moody had and went in that hall. Also, the, one of the greatest Bible schools ever, uh, Glasgow Bible Institute, was founded because of that. And the money was given to him. Well, I'll tell you, you talk about a background. One of the most wonderful men I ever saw was C.T. Studd. Well, C.T. Studd's daddy used to buddy with the King of England. When I used to, I used to do in World War II, I went to one of the largest uh, Air Force camps in, in, the, in the nation, and I had to go up a hill and to the right in the moonlight, I could see this estate where C.T. used to live with a private race course. Well, C.T.'s daddy went to London, I mixed up with all the society. Then he heard about this Yankee preacher, well, let's go. Well, when he got there, Somebody asked a man to pray while, uh, while um, what do you call him now? While Moody was on the platform going to preach, they sang a hymn and said, pray. And this guy went on and on and Moody jumped up and said, let's sing a song while this fellow finishes. So immediately they were happy, you know, the guy wasn't tied up to formality. Well, they listened and CT, I think his father got saved there. As a result, he took the, the three most famous cricketers in England. C.T. was the Babe Ruth of the English critic. Cricket. Well, they went. And the whole society like that went. Well, C.T. joined up with the K other six, and they formed the Cambridge Seven and went to China. I mean, there's all kinds of things happen out of that. One revival of an illiterate man that didn't care if they laughed at his clothes and everything. And he received opposition. Well, nothing happened like that till the 1920s or 26 or something like that, when, when uh, George Jeffries went to whole crusades in England. And Stephen Jeffries had greater uh, works than that. And they go to a town without a penny and believe God to fill an auditorium with 3,000 people in a week, and they did it. And they weren't great expositors. Brother Raven Hill in Jeremiah, the prophet says, Thus saith the Lord. Yes. Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Yeah. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. 
But they said, we will not walk therein. Well, going back, uh, Brother Larry, I said uh, we've turned the light out in the street. We've no more uh, street meetings. We've turned the light out Sunday night. Many churches don't have a Sunday night meeting. Wednesday night, that's about the biggest tragedy. People say, don't you think we should get the Bible back in school? I said, that's not the first problem. Get it back in the home. Why don't, how many people meet? Ask the deacons in your church. Ask the pastor. How many of you have family worship? They don't have it. As soon as supper's over, they have to go and... Uh, get on TV and leave it till the kiddies go to bed. They don't know the Word of God. I had a man here, and his daughter came to bring me some mail, and, and I, she's 14. I said, well, dearie, how much scripture do you memorize? Oh, I haven't memorized any. I said, can you memorize the Ten Commandments? She couldn't say the Ten Commandments. Two days after, a young guy came, he lives across town. He has seven children. The eldest boy is 13. He's memorized every word of every chapter in, uh, in uh, Proverbs. And the other boy is 10, and he's memorized 12 chapters of Proverbs, every word. The man gets up with his wife at 4 to 4.30 in the morning, the other now together with the Word of God. They get the children up just after 5 and then teach them the Word of God and prayer. And then the children have a rest, and the mother teaches them the rest of the day. She's homeschooling them how they do it. But those little kids are walking Bibles. But we don't know the Word of God. Two things we don't know. In fact, I said to the seminary men, do you know God? Well, I, I, I didn't know, no. I, I, I answered yes or no. Oh, oh, I learned Hebrew. I didn't ask if you know Hebrew. Do you know God? You got us ten young people in your church to answer in, in less than 50 words. Why did Jesus come into the world? To save us from hell, to save us from sin. And so they go on. But what does Jesus say in, in John 17:2? that they may know Thee, the only true God. And that's the essence. We don't know God. If we knew God, we'd set the world on fire. If we knew God, we wouldn't beg for money. We know things about God, but we don't know God. We don't know God. Well, I want to tell you then, in 1932, I preached in Swansea, South Wales, in a little upper room, and there's a lady there with white hair, and she said, uh, Do you know my husband? I said, I didn't know you had one. She said, well, my husband is Major Russell. I said, well, who's Major Russell? In the British Army? No, Salvation Army. <coughs> she said, would you come up? Come up and have a meal with us? I said, well, this is a crusade. And he said, I only have Friday off. I said, I'll take the bus and come up to the place that's called Rubina. I'll come up Friday afternoon. She said, well, come and have some tea and, and we'll talk. So here's a grey-haired fellow sitting. And I said to him, well, it's a privilege to come and talk with you. How old are you? He said, well, I'm 82. And he said, I'll tell you some things that when you're my age, I said, I'll never live to be 82. Well, I'm 84 now, nearly 85. But uh, he shared the office with, with William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. I said, what were the days like? Days like heaven on earth. He said, God the Holy Ghost came. And he mentioned a certain place which is on the Strand in London. He said, now it's, it's a, a theatre. In those days, it's a, a hall you hired, and movies weren't uh, houses and theatres weren't open on Sunday, so you could rent them on Sunday, so you used to rent them Saturday and Sunday. And he said, uh, he said, I've been in that meeting. He said, people won't believe you when you tell them, and then I was, well, that was 1932, so it's almost 60 years back. And he said, when you tell them, won't believe you. I said, whether they believe me or not, tell me. I said, I want to know. I don't care if it puts my nose in the ground. Don't care what you say, as long as you realize that just as you're a link with the past, at my age of 82, I'll be a link with another generation that doesn't know God. So I said, well, I'll tell you what happened. He said, William Booth could preach like nobody else from Jeremiah, the harvest is past, or somebody said it, oh, his favorite was, and he had a gruff voice, if thou hast run with a footman and they have wearied thee, I will now do in the swelling of the Jordan, fire a volley, which meant say hallelujah, so they all roar hallelujah, you know. And he said, that, but what William Booth could, he could get men trembling, he said. He said, as a matter of fact, you give them a hymn book of maybe 25 pages, and they'd sit with it on their lap and shred it while they were, they were so disturbed. And he said, you could see where these men had been, all the back pews were full of shredded hymn books. The same thing happened in 1926, I taught with, uh, I taught with uh, the greatest revivalist 
uh, islands ever had, W.P. Nicholson, he said, Brother Len, he said, people used to shred the hymn books when we listened, they were under conviction, they were so nervous, and sweat would run off the noses, not that it doesn't happen anymore. Anyhow, going back to this, he said the old William would preach hellfire boys and he could make you shake. And he said, but he couldn't make an altar call. So he would say, now come to the mercy seat, come to the mercy, come run for your life, you're going to hell. And he couldn't get anywhere, so he'd, he'd shout out, where is Lawley, where is Lawley? Well, Commissioner Lawley was one of the stalwarts for the Salvation Army, like Bringle. And he said he was under the platform. And it come out, and they used to hang close to each other, you know, like somebody gave me your suit, it would be hanging down on me, and Commissioner Lawley's coat was down to his ankles. But he said, it come out on all fours and do this, and be a cloud of dust. And then Lawley would begin to make an appeal, you know, come to the mercy seat, and he said the altar would be lined, but sometimes they wouldn't come. He said the general would turn around and roar at us, you know, pray! Boys, everybody looked down and prayed. And usually there's a break, but he said, this day they prayed, and nothing happened, so he said again, pray! He said, everybody's nervous. Hey, what's happening to the old boy? He's angry, he's angry. Well, let's pray, and he said, Lord, Lord, move right now, move right now. And he said, uh, nobody came, so a third time he'd roar, you know, get hold of God, he said, this meeting is going to go to hell, these people are perishing, some of them are wealthy, some are poor, some are ignorant, some are backslidden, pray! And he said, the Holy Ghost would take all the men on the back seat and lift them bodily over the congregation and drop them at the altar. I've said to Pentecostal, you saw that, you'd run for the door, you say, spiritism or something. I said, but there was an unwritten law in the Salvation Army, they called their churches a corps, you know, like, uh, like the army does, C-O-R-P-S, corps. And uh, it was an unwritten law in the Salvation Army that when you finish your stream meeting at 9 o'clock, Saturday night, you go to pray till midnight. And he said to me, we had men that would pray, and one old man particularly would say, he'd jump up maybe at 12 or 1 and raise his hand and shout, victory, victory, there'll be 10 tomorrow. And he said there'd be nine or ten saved. Or he'd say there'd be fifteen, there'd be thirteen or fourteen. He said there was only one or two out every time. But he said, remember, we had street meetings, we got baptized with rotten eggs. The, the, in those days, there were no houses with bathrooms. They kept a, uh, a what they call a pot, a pot under the bed, and they'd always empty. And people would run out or throw it from a window and throw urine on them. And he said, we kept two coats. You kept an old one with eggs. And, and you went home and scraped them off, and then you put your Sunday best on. And he said, but, he said, who cares when there's revival? As I said to you, you don't have to advertise a fire. Colonel Bringle was the biggest orator in America, and uh, I don't know who it was, one of the multimillionaires offered to build him the biggest church in America, give him the biggest salary if he would stay. He said, I'm going to London. Why? Because he said, there's a fire. There's a man called William Booth, who was a Methodist, they got rid of him. And he's having revival, and he went and had revival. And he gathered all kinds of people to him. But the secret again, but they had a burning. You went in a prayer meeting, you, you know, you felt the glory, the majesty of God. And now you don't do that. Like I was with a team not long ago. Well, before the meeting at night, we went in a side room, and they had hot tea and cold tea and drinks and fruit and everything, and trivia talking, and straight off there to the platform. How do you suddenly turn off and suddenly become spiritual? We travel the country, but I walk the length of England, I walk the breadth of England with five college fellows. We slept in fields at night, we slept in churches. We didn't get a penny wage in six months, and nobody ever said a word. Because at night, we'd kneel in the street at 10 and 11 o'clock at night, and people get saved in the street. You don't care a who where you sleep. We slept in sleeping bags for three years. Slept on the floor of churches, anywhere they'd take us in. But we had revival, the churches are still standing today. But now, I go to a meeting and everybody's silly, oh, it's nice to see you. And they want to talk, I say, well, leave, leave me alone. Well, we, went, we went, brother, we had a solid hour of prayer together, 11 o'clock to 12 in the morning. Then we had a bit of a rest in the afternoon and mostly went to prayer. Then we had a prayer meeting one hour before the night service, went on the platform, charged with the power of God and full of expectation and faith. And night by night, the altars were lined with people. We don't do that today. We've got Miss So-and-so, she's number one on the charts. We've got So-and-so. And it's humanism. We're depending on something we have. 
I mean, you clap, you go to one charismatic meeting, you've been to them all, you stand and sing for 30, 40 minutes. We're trying to work something up when God has to send something down. I can remember, dear brother, when you went to a holiness meeting in England or, or uh, Pentecostal, there were more people at the altar before the service than after. I used to fear going when I was 14. I used to go, my daddy used to take me to a Pentecostal meeting, and the whole row of the front would be full, and they'd be praying with energy and, and crying to God. One old man particularly would say, Come Lord and walk in our midst. And I used to think, I hope he doesn't, because I'm scared to death he would. But God used to come in the meeting. And then at the end, he didn't have to beg and sing emotional songs. There's room at the cross. I forget it. There's room on the cross. Forget there's room at the cross. Get on the cross. And as Tozer said, a man going down the road with a cross, you know one thing about him, he wasn't coming back. Our people don't want to die. There's only two kinds of people in the world, those who are dead to sin and those who are dead in sin. And we're in one of two. In fact, you talk about victory, they laugh at you. Oh, you can't live in victory. Well then, why, why don't you be a Buddhist to somebody? What do you do with somebody that says, Look, I don't just want to get I want to be pure in heart. You can't be pure in heart. Who says so? One of the latest books off the press says you can't. Who cares if he'll be? What does the Word of God say? What did Jesus say to the bad woman that came to him? Go and sin less? He says that to a woman who's been spending in immorality before the cross. What does, what does Paul say? Let him that stole steal less. No study is cut off. What we need in America, dear brothers, is more than ever, we need people to go forth with a new birth message. Forget all about tongues, forget all about miracles and signs and wonders, in case they're not happening anyhow. Let's get back to real genuine conversion. Why? Most of our kids, our teenagers, they go to a, they go to a Christian camp. Well, Christian camps are not much better than others. I mean, I had a missionary here, very, one of the few men I really respect in the world, he came from India and he came through Hawaii, so he went to a very famous Bible school there. What do you think of it? He said, well, he said, the girls' shorts were so bad when they came toward me, I was disgusted. When they went the other way, it was worse. So he said to the world-famous leader, you've no dress code here. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, the girls come towards me. He said, you can't tell they've shorts on, they're so short. When they go the other way, they're terrible. And the reply he got from the famous leader was, as long as their cheeks are not showing, they're all right. So as a girl's backside to be showing, they, you can't even not preach holiness, you can't preach modesty these days. Because kids are used to getting saved and going straight back to the old way, they go mixed mix men in some of the meetings around here. They'll have two missionary groups, go to wet and wild. But what do guys want to stand with half-naked women, women in bikinis or as near as they can to that? I had a man came to see me a few weeks ago and he said, uh, He'd been to a minister near here, and he said, I went to the meeting last night, it was very good, I enjoyed it. But then he said this morning, they said we were meeting at the swimming pool, he said, there was my wife. For the first time in her life, my five children saw the mother almost naked, standing in a pool, and I realized this is not for me, and he left it. And another man left, not after. And he said, we, if you can't have modesty, where can you have it? And they don't want to pray, they have no appetite for prayer. But the old Salvation Army thrived on prayer. The greatest revivals in history, the Shangtung Revival, when, uh, well, what was over there? Munson was there, and uh, the woman that died last year, a hundred years old, uh, Bertha Smith with the Southern Baptist, she was born again, she was filled with the Holy Ghost in that revival. And they expected God to move in phenomenal ways. They didn't advertise it. You don't have to advertise it. What we need is God in the midst. If God is in the midst, a lot of our stuff would never take place. Just let God come. His very presence. That happened in the Welsh Revival. You know when you go to a revival now, the big guy gets up, they sing, then Bev says somebody's going to sing, then something else, then so, and it's all programmed beforehand. How can God come in? Well, one of the things that I, I as I say, I went with that man who, uh, that Welshman who went through the revival with, uh, with William Booth, 
But then I said, what about the Welsh Revival? He said, I'll tell you what happened in the Welsh Revival. He said, I was with William Booth in his office. We were having meetings uh, in London. And somebody sent me a note, my wife. A revival has broken out. There's a young man in his 20s, Evan Roberts, and he's packing everywhere he goes. He won't even let them publicize him. He won't let them put his picture in the paper. They'll just announce he's coming to Swansea, and every church in town is filled because they don't know where he's going. So he said, well, I knew I, uh, Friday afternoon I, had, I could leave uh, Friday afternoon and that's Saturday free and I couldn't come back Sunday and get to the office for Monday morning so I said I went there, meeting was crowded in one meeting Evan Roberts comes in, there's 800 people which isn't big for America but there it's the largest hall in town and Evan walks down to the front seat sits down, bows his head and prayed for three hours our people walk out but then he stood up for 15 minutes, he said, you know, don't, heard not like it in your life. The Holy Ghost came upon him, and he was a big man. When he prayed, God just came down as though he jumped in the audience. And that happened more than once. But he said, once I had that young man, and of course the Welsh can sing like nobody on earth, guard me, O thou great Jehovah, these are the great hymns. And he said, at the end of the meeting, he said, uh, you of course, you end it. the meeting was, no, 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 no. He just, after he'd uh, prayed for three hours and spoke for 50 minutes, he went out. At 10 o'clock at night, he prayed the whole night for the anointing for the next day. Our guys don't do that. They go sit and talk and say silly jokes. We want to be spiritual and carnal, spiritual, carnal, hot and cold, all out for God, all out for the cowboys. God says no. And you've done it for 25 years. Why not quit and start something different? Okay, so then he said, I, I stayed the first day, boy, he said, I was hooked. Here's this young man preaching like nobody had ever preached in my life, praying as nobody had prayed, in tears. And he said, I listened the first day, I thought, well, I, I can still get the, the train overnight and get back to my office Monday morning. But boy, he said, Sunday night was better, so I stayed the next day. And then I thought, well, I'm in trouble anyhow, the general will be after me. Oh, no, no because I can use this other day is my day off for this week. And he kept bargaining with himself like that. And he goes home on Saturday, Friday night. He goes in the office. He said, William Booth just turned around and said, Russell, where have you been? You know, barked at me. And he said, just say quietly, General, I've been to heaven. You been where? I've been to heaven. What do you mean you've been to heaven? He said, sir, the Spirit of God is on a man in Wales, a young man, almost without tutoring, he hadn't been to a Salvation Army college, but God is upon him, he's been in hiding for 13 years. Dear God, he's only 26 years of age, he prayed for 13 years. I say to preachers, when I get a chance, I say, listen, you can, I said, you say, I need a vacation, you don't need, a, you need a cave. I said, can you go for three, so you can't go for three hours without turning TV on. You don't need grace to pull down strongholds, you need grace to stop TV. That's the devilish thing, that's, it's, it's not the devil, it's your choices. Anyhow, he said, the general said, well, tell me about it, tell me about it. He said, he said the general just relaxed in it, and I told him, how God had worked. And he said, there's no begging people. They come and rush to the scene and cry. And he said, the police are not arresting anybody. The, the, the judges are not, the, the courts are closed. The taverns are closed. They have prayer meetings in the coal mine. They used to take a, a little tin, you know, with the, what do you call it, a, a food tin you take. And, and they call it having their snap. You've only a little time. And, in, and, and they'd eat the snap before they start working, and then they'd spend the rest of the time praying in the dinner or, or, or singing in the coal mines. And he said, I went on to tell him what miracles were being done. He said, the general put his finger up, he said, uh, he said, remember uh, uh, Russell? He said, in the very early days, the very first days of the salvation, I mean, it was just like that. The glory of the Lord came down. We're getting too commercial, we're getting too mechanical. We'll have to go back to the glory of the Lord in the same way. 
And all the Bible says is pray without ceasing. It doesn't say preach without ceasing. It doesn't say do miracles. It says pray. And well, like somebody may ask me if I know you fellows. Well, I'd say, well, I've met them, but I don't, I don't know anybody till I've prayed with him. I don't care who he is. And I know some of the outstanding personalities in the world today, but I haven't prayed with them, so I don't know them. But once a man opens his heart, and it's one thing for us to stand between, uh, stand before God on behalf of people, it's a greater thing to stand before God on behalf of people than stand before God, and stand before people on behalf of God. As I quoted the other day to some people, uh, what is it about the 34th chapter of of Exodus, where Moses had been on the mountain, and God says, let me alone. I said, that's God saying to a man, leave me alone. I said, did God ever say that to you? I said, it's wonderful when a man lays hold of God. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing in one sense when a man lays hold of God. But when God lays hold of a man, and God says, let me alone, and I literally destroy these people. But are we not there? John Wesley preached on Romans 8.16 more than anything else for the witness of the Spirit. Oh, well, I want the Spirit to wear witness. I'm walking in holiness. I want you to bear witness. I'm speaking truth. I want you to... I said, do you want to, do you want to borrow his language in Romans 9? Where Paul said, I call the Holy Ghost to bear witness that I lie not. Can the Holy Ghost bear witness? I said, in essence, what Paul says, that I'll be damned if need be. If all, only you'll just rend the heavens and come down. And I said... You keep, you keep praying again, Isaiah, what, 64, for all that thou wouldst rend the heavens and God shoots back, rend your hearts and not your garments. Don't put a one hour prayer meeting on, make it a lifestyle. I used to, I told the deacons the last church I had in England, I said, listen, I'll take the church on this condition, number one, that you meet with me at least a half hour to 40 minutes before every service, number two, you abolish offerings so we don't have to beg from the poor people, and that you meet with me Friday night, 9 o'clock till midnight, we did and got turned that church, church round. And I don't know any, any ministry that's had the same t time in prayer. Have you, read, have you read George Burns at all? No. Well, you read Robert Mary McShane? No, George Burns. Have you read Robert Mary McShane? Yes. Well, well, Mary McShane, I stood outside of his church in, uh, in, um, Anyhow, it's on the coast of Scotland, Aberdeen, Scotland. Well, he was a man that prayed and wept and prayed and wept and prayed and wept until his health went, so he went to be a missionary. He was a brilliant man in Hebrew, and he went and had a rest in, uh, what was this? Israel then, or Palestine. And while he was there, W.C. Burns came in the church, and the Holy Ghost was upon him, because he'd spent days and weeks in prayer. And the whole town was rocked with the revival. The whole city was moved. There's never been revival before or since. I said the Kilsyth revival. So anyhow, W.C. Burns has this tremendous move of God. And we would book him up for London and book him up for Manchester. Oh, the anointing is on him. Open the way, let the guy go. Out of that, God picked that man up, dear brother, and took him to China and dropped him in China. And he died unknown from a modern Pentecost. Go and pray. And he went and prayed and fasted and wept in that area. So what happened? After him, Jonathan Goforth went. Mrs. Goforth says, they will go to a meeting in the morning at nine and stand and sing and praise God and they still be praising him at five o'clock. Nobody sat down, didn't even know they were tired. You go the next day, there'll be no singing. It will be prayer the whole day. You go the next day, there's neither singing nor prayer the whole day in the quietness, she said, and in the quietness was more productive than the other meetings. I told the people, this week, we've forgotten how to be quiet, be still and know that I'm God is as real as be filled with the Spirit. Anyhow, Jonathan Goforth went, the old ground was broken up and teared, tears stained by W.C. Burns. Jonathan Goforth went, after him came um, Watchman Lee, and I don't know if you read the life of um, John Sung, have you read his life? That's the most fabulous thing I've read outside the New Testament, I think. Well, I quoted him as being the most distinguished scholar, foreign scholar ever came to America. He learned English, he learned German and did his PhD in German. He took his BA degree, his MA degree, learned a new language, 
took his uh, his doctorate in three and a half years, and finally he went to um, Union Theological Seminary in New York. And when he was there, a young man said to him, "You look more like a preacher." And like a scientist, well, five different nations begged him to come on their on their payroll and be their leader in nuclear fission, even those years ago. And he refused them. Well, to cut a long story short, one night he knelt down and he said, Well, Lord, my dad is a Methodist preacher and I, I, I'm not born again. I don't know God. And right there, God came upon him. He jumped up, opened the door, ran down the corridor in Union Theological Seminary, right the one in Acts 3, leaping and praising God. The next day they certified him insane and put him in the white, in, in, in a institution. And there the Lord said to him, I can get you out of here. But, he, but stay here, I forget the number, like 195 days I'll teach you my way. And he learned, dear brother, how to analyze a chapter eight different ways. And then he went back to China. He threw all his diplomas overboard in the China Sea, and he began his ministry. Married the girl that the neighbor had said they'd marry when they were kids. Took it a long story short, I was preaching in a meeting, and I quoted the story, and a big oversized woman at the organ, and she'd been playing, tears rolling down her face. So afterwards, she said, well, that was a, a lovely meeting. I said, I noticed you were weeping. I said, that story of, uh, that story of uh, John Sung, uh, did you hear it before? She said, no, Mr. Ray, I used to play his, in his meetings in revival in China. I said, well, did I exaggerate? She said, you couldn't exaggerate that man, doesn't what you say. But she said, I'll tell you one thing, that I went after he died, and he died as a young man, he died of tuberculosis. She said, he would come from a meeting at night, and he never, he never did like the others. He didn't get Western clothes, and he wanted an American jacket and a white shirt. He just had a figure that he tied on his shoulder and a lock of hair that fell down. And she said, he stayed in the home of a friend of mine, and uh, he, he would leave a half door open, you know, to get the air. And she said, he would come in after the meeting, and his shirt sticking to his back, and he would be heaving like a dog. And this lady said to her after, you know, of all the preachers we've ever had in this country, I've never seen a man like John Sung. He lives and moves as his being in God. And she said, he comes home every night sobbing and weeping, and his shirt stuck to his back. And she said, one scripture only leaps to my mind when I see him. And she said, what's that? This is my body which is broken for you. And she said, that was where he lived. He didn't tell other people who lived there. But he lived economically, and he lived all the time. Well, his book is written. Uh, uh, Inman Mission published it. And if you see it by, it's worth a thousand dollars. I mean, I've, I've tried to contact men that like that of live, move, and other being in God. They aren't theorists. There's all kinds of theory. I could, in fact, right now I should be in Australia with a team that will go on to Hong Kong and China and everywhere. But the thing is, there's a hunger now. Young men in this country have never seen revival. They've never seen meetings that go on until 2 or 3 in the morning. People that won't go home. Or if they do go home, say, I can't eat, I can't turn on my TV. I'm so hungry for God. I'm so tired of my neighbors going to hell. I'm told my daughter came home and tells me she's pregnant. My son came home, he's on drugs. There's all kinds of messing, even amongst believers, even amongst the pastors' children. So what we, what we need to rediscover the value of a human soul. Our people need to be taught what repentance is, what the atonement is, what forgiveness is, what pardon is, what justification is, what the witness of this. They don't know. They want to kneel down and in five minutes pass from death to life and become a full-blown Christian. It can't happen. Jackie Bollinger was here and uh, we were talking about people being converted. She said, well, uh, a man knocked at my door recently, and I went and I said, well, let's call him Bill, that wasn't his name. Oh, Bill, come in. No, no, Miss Jackie, I'm being a bad boy. Uh, I left you 13 years ago. You took me in. I was a, a drug addict. I was a drunkard. I was a fighter. I was a bad man. And I got saved and filled with the Spirit and spoke in tongues. But then I just went to the devil. The devil took me. I left my wife and child. I took another woman. I've been in and out of Prince. I know I've seen your record in the newspaper. But, but he said, uh, I've been wicked for almost 13 years. I've done everything shamelessly. But three months ago, in my present cell, Jesus came to me. 
and I was saved again, and he's restored me, and had his peace, and had his joy. But he said, Miss Jackie, I want to tell you that every night for the last three months I've wept two to three hours every night. And she thought she would comfort him. She said, Well, Bill, you don't need to do that. Your sins are under the blood. They forgot. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not worried about my sins. What are you worried about? I'm worried about the fact that for 13 years I've denied God the right to use my tongue and use my heart and use my mind and use my thinking. She said, and I'm sorry. She said that's the best case of repentance I ever heard. Well, this one isn't just saying I did these lousy things, but I've denied God the right. What, what could I have been if I'd? What would Swaggart be if he hadn't messed his life up? He might have been a new deliverer for this nation, but the devil got him. And now he's arrogant. He says, it's no business of yours. They tell me when he said that two weeks ago, the audience stood up and clapped and gave him a standing ovation. He'll gather thousands of people living in adultery and devilry. They don't care. I just hope God spares him. I mean, if I were God, I'd cut the guy off. He's had his second chance. Adam didn't get a second chance. Judas didn't get a second chance. Why does Shrugger expect it? But we're in that day now where sin doesn't, sin doesn't mean much to us. I mean, I, I weep over the guy, but what does Jesus do? He crucified the Son of God afresh. I was reading last night with Martha. I said, Darling, look, I don't understand this. In fact, I wrote to a friend at 2 o'clock this morning where, what a, is it, 2 Corinthians 3 says, uh, the fire shall try every man's work, and uh, what, not what size it is, but what sort it is, and then, uh, but the thing that bowls me over, maybe you fellows can help me, maybe that's why the Lord sent you today, and I'm serious about this. I think it's first Corinthians. Yeah, one, one Corinthians 3, that's right. Yeah, man. One Corinthians three, is it? Verse thirteen. Yes. Everyone's work should be manifest for the day shall declare it. Well, let's let's put it in a nutshell. Dear brothers, when you and I go to the judgment, we're not gonna have our passports checked. We're going to have our baggage checked. What have we been collecting all our lives? If men build about, okay, well, look at verse 13. If any, anyone's work shall be made manifest, the day shall declare, because it will be revealed by fire, the fire shall tell any man's work what sort, not what sight it is. Now, if any man's work abide, which is built there, on to receive a reward. Now, look at this 15th verse. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved by fire. Now look at verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Now what do you do? God's going to destroy that man. Did Jimmy Swaggart ever think he was standing before five billion people, or you and I will, with all the archangels there, all the apostles of the, old, of the New Testament, all the uh, prophets of the Old Testament gazing on me, and God reads my record out? We've lost sight of the judgment. If we began every meeting in the light of the judgment, we'd be prostrate before the end of this service. We wouldn't think about running home to turn the lousy TV on. The early Pentecostal meetings, brother used to go at eight in the morning and stay till five or six at night. They had a meal on the grounds, uh, particularly in America. And then have an afternoon session and an evening session, have three or four sermons. I don't know so we have to go to that. But this is, nobody's answered my question. Him shall God destroy. Not his record be destroyed, but he shall be destroyed. How can a man mix with a harlot when he knows his body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and that is holy in his head? I mean, the body is the temple. Isn't it awesome when you think two men five years ago had the world at their feet? Jimmy Swaggart got arrogant because he said God called him to evangelize the world in the first place. That's wrong. He said there's nobody to go to. David Wilson went to him two years before that mess up. He went to PTL two years before and told them, and they wouldn't listen to him. It's no good saying they'd no friends. They were so arrogant, they became alone to themselves. Nobody dared correct them. They wouldn't listen to counsel. They got on a crest, on a, as they say in the world, they got on a roll. 
Swaggart's taking three million a week in. I, I hear he still takes in a nearly a million a week. But where's the power? I'm not looking for a, a, a modern Elijah. I'm looking for a, a kind of a hundred Elijahs in different areas to, to come. We've had all the other. Would you respond to, to this passage of Scripture from Isaiah in light of what you're saying? In Isaiah 29, verse 13, it says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me yes. with their mouth, Yes. And with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, yeah. and their fear yes. toward me yes. is taught by the precept of men. Yeah. Their fear towards me is taught by the precept of men. It's all being watered down. I mean, don't fear. I mean, Are God. Men teaching us the precept, the, the fear of, of God, and not the spirit of God teaching us the fear of God. Yeah, but I mean, you, you got the. Uh, Again, uh, the more I read, the more I've read the last month of Noah, I just think I've read the Bible with my eyes closed before. He was moved with fear. Did he think? What do you think happened, dear brother? The first ten years after he told those people he's building the ark, don't cut that tree down. Adam used to know that tree. What are you doing? Ruining the countryside, cutting your trees down? What are you doing? All lying there. And he got his family with him that were wonderful. I mean, they weren't 17, 18 year old kids. They must have been 100 years old. But anyhow, the fact is, after 10 years, I say, listen, you old fool. There used to be a man going up. My grandpa says an old man went up down there with a white beard with his hands raised to heaven. Remember, they'd never seen a Bible. They'd never seen a priest, never seen an altar, never seen a sacrifice. And yet Enoch walks up and down, doesn't care a hill of beans. And God made a hole in the sky. And he saw something that hasn't happened yet. The Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. We think gentle Jesus, meek and mild, is coming. Forget it. Everybody likes that. Name. Charles Wesley wrote it. What about, I wrote to a guy this, as I said, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock this morning. Lo, he comes with clouds. When he comes, he's going to be terrible in his majesty. Nobody's going to jump on his knee or say, Papa, I've come to see you. Forget it. We're going to fall. I mean, if John fell at his feet as dead, and John used to lay his head on his bosom, what are you and I going to do? But we don't live in that realm. We don't live in the realm of the Spirit. We live in the realm of reason. And we've reasoned, oh, God is a loving God. He doesn't send more judgment. He does, and he's going to do. I think we're heading for the next, unless a miracle happens, we'll have a financial clash within three years, a bankruptcy, which may do something. But on the other hand, I don't believe that if we had two earthquakes and one went north to south other way and, and America was in four pieces that people would repent. They only repent when conviction of sin comes. You can't deny the Holy Ghost is office right. When he is coming, he will convict, com, convict of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. We don't live in that area. I mean, nobody expects Jesus to come today. They say they do, but if they do... He that hath this hope in him, purify. It doesn't say when he is come, he'll give us 24 hours notice. If we're in purity, he'll call us. If we're in purity, he won't call us. When we should be like him, not, not an hour after he comes, not a day after, but that very moment, if I'm not walking in the will of God in known purity, I don't believe we'll be taken. Doesn't matter if you're pastor of the biggest church in town or Ten times as big as Billy Graham won't make any difference. All our ideas are perverted anyhow. There's not much meekness. Blessed the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Well, dear God, where is there meekness anymore? Oh, we have the biggest church in town. We're on so many radio stations. Oral Roberts used to say that. Swaggart said it. So has he got them? God is a jealous God. Paul said, for such are false apostles. Deceitful workers, yes. transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Yes. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, yes. it is no great thing if his ministers be. also be transformed yes. as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Yes. Ministers of righteousness, yes. but ministers of Satan. Don't you think that, like when you talk to some people, 
uh, about victory in the Christian. Oh, well, my righteousness is as filthy rags as I will get saved. What does John say? He that, he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. I mean, you can't be partly dis... I mean, there are no degrees in purity. There are degrees in life. There are no degrees in death. That man's dead. This man isn't. He's injured. He's incapacitated. He has a mind problem, physical. But you preach Christian perfection. They laugh at you these days. Purity. They just scorn. But the scriptures say he that is hoping in purified himself. Then Paul writes to the, to the uh, Peter rather, in his first epistle, ye have purified your hearts by faith. As I said to a congregation, you are just as spiritual as you want to be. All these men here only had the same Bible I have. They used it better. They'd only 24 hours on the clock. I could do with a 48-hour clock, and I'd still use it. Now, but, are you, now are you clean by the word which I've spoken yes. unto you? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his Tense wife, his by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Yes. Well, it goes on to say that very thing, does it? Uh, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin, not just occasionally get victory. I mean, dear God, what's the difference between us and others? Oh, speaking in tongues, Mormons speak in tongues. Every devout Mormon speaks in tongues. But they live like devils, a lot of them. There's only one thing I think the devil can't fake, and that's a holy life. He's tried to do it through monasteries, but going back a minute, I don't know if you read it, and I don't know if you read it recently, in two different uh, accounts where two different men said, if I could now, I would start a Christian monastery. What they mean is, like the Bible school I went to, there were no TVs in those days, there were radios, you couldn't take a radio, you couldn't take an automobile. When you went on the campus, you stayed from uh, October till Christmas, they went home for a few days, came back and stayed till Easter, you could go off the campus, they had to have a haircut. You couldn't go shopping, you couldn't drive a car, anything. There were no girls there, they're too distracting. And we were shut up. You came here to know the Word of God, and they did a pretty good job. But now, dear God, I know a boy that went to ORU. His daddy has an agency of cars. He gave him a new car, bought him a new typewriter, bought him new clothes, a new set of golf clubs, everything he had. And within a month, he wrapped the new car around a lamp post. Total wreckage, called back and said, oh, oh, don't come home, don't come home, Mommy's bringing you a new car tomorrow. And that's all they did, back him up like that. Old Robert says he has 4,000 young people there full of the Holy Ghost baloney. How could you have 4,000? There were only 120 in the upper room. His people go to, they can't dance on the premises, but they go to other places to dance. Why don't you have places where they say students are spending all night in prayer? In intercession, we've never been in the mess we're in now. We're nearer judgment than we've ever been in America and England. I think England, America, the modern Sodom and the modern Gomorrah. They never had the chances we have. They never had the Bible schools, never had the seminars, never had all the Christian periodicals. How many, at this moment, how many, how many teams do you think there are around America, either going around teaching spiritual warfare or something else? Every magazine you come out, we've got something new. And we're feeding jaded appetites. If we once had a Holy Ghost revival that, say, got all of uh, a dozen or a hundred men in, in, a, in a factory, and they began, instead of going to lunch, they, they had a lunch, and then they had a prayer meeting or something, it would soon spread, but we don't know that. And uh, I don't know by, well, by what I read, we're going to do the same thing the next ten years we've done. In the last ten years we've done nothing. But it's like... Uh, Spurgeon said, you, you see there's a stick there and it's the most crooked stick you've ever seen. Don't argue about it. Put the straight stick at the side of it. You see, the truth with our young people, brother, they don't know. They don't know what they believe. Like John, uh, Fred Wolfe has one of the biggest Southern Baptist church in, in, in Mobile. I've preached there and he's put a new building up since, since 4,000. And he says, he said, we feel responsible for 11,000 students in this area. But he said, I wonder why it is. In their sophomore year, which is what, the second year that they're in college, they leave church. Well, you can guarantee those kids went to Dedication Bible School, most likely went to a Christian camp, 
I guarantee 99, 95% have made a profession of Christianity. When they get away from home, I'm not going to go to church. You can play sports here. You can go down to the sea and bathe. You can have a Why do they desert like that? I mean, why don't they have an appetite for God? But they don't. I mean, three weeks ago, the, the fellow that's taken up the, uh, to be assistant of, of Dr. Criswell, he blasted uh, uh, Baylor University, the mess it's in. But then guys told me, going to Baylor, uh, it's not known any longer as a spiritual place. It's known now as a, a, well, it's a liberal arts college, and it's known mostly for its football team. But why do the kids suddenly... I have no appetite when they get teenagers get away from home or I won't have to go to church Sunday night. My folk have made me go every time. They have no appetite. So there's no relationship with God. And if we spent time at the altar and took them through step by step what it means to become a Christian, your life is hid with Christ in God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. That You've no time of your own. You've no money of your own. You've no interest of your own. Christ must become a complete master. We don't do that. And unless we do, we're not going to have a change. I mean, there are people who are really hungry. There are people that meet Dave Wilkinson's folk on the streets. Well, I've never seen a Christian in my life. Well, what, what they say, the average church member is just like us. Very often they're smoking until they go in the meeting at last. At last minute, when they come out, it's the cowboys or something. Where's the difference? And it isn't there. But it all comes down, it, it, I don't care whether it's Swaggart or PTO, it comes down, it breaks down with personal devotion to Christ. They quit praying, they quit reading the Word of God, they haven't time. And therefore they start rotting from the inside. There isn't a nation big enough to destroy America, we'll destroy ourselves. The present rate of development in herpes and AIDS is appalling. The, list, the lid hasn't been taken off the thing yet. I don't think the government dare tell us what's happening in the country. It's the same in England. But where are God-filled men? I mean, Swaggart says, the day after he'd been in that trouble, I was going to step down and let my son take over, but I woke up full of the Holy Ghost. No, he woke up full of tongues. He gave his tongues and he took it as a sign. But the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. I see a girl wearing a big ring and she says, well, Jack gave me that. I go back to the church six months after and say, well, oh, did he get mad? Oh, no, we, we quarreled after that. But you're still wearing the ring. Yes, well, of course, uh, Jack's gone, but he left his ring. By the same token, the Holy Ghost has gone, but he left his gift. The gifts and callings are without repentance. Who moved London more than Irving? Edward Irving in his day. Carriages jostled each other, Parliament suspended so they could run out near this great holiday. Every kind of sign and wonder built that colossal church. And finally, stood on the platform and said, I am the Son of God. I've cut this veil to you, but now here I am. There's everything. Men call him the 13th Apostle. There's no, there's no questions about what happened. There's a whole book on him. I have it. And you've got all these amazing moves. I guess you've read something of Wigglesworth. Have you read John, John G. Lake? John G. Lake's books are published now by Christ for the Nations. There's four of them. That man is... Well, here I'm standing here and I talk with Wigglesworth. Wigglesworth is here. I'm here. John Lake is up there. You talk about apostolic Christianity and it all beyond anything we've ever known. I don't think it's the only answer. I think the answer is when people are so transformed, they're no longer mean, they're no longer selfish, no longer covetous, but they give themselves... I mean, when children say, something happened to my daddy, he's been a Baptist for all his life, or something happened, or my daddy's been a Methodist, or now my daddy's been a charismatic, but something suddenly changed, he's become different, he's Christ-like. He speaks gently to my mother. He's concerned about us. It isn't, well, I'm going to the World Series, whether you like it or not, or I'm going to uh, a ball game, you know, Super Bowl. And I say to these preachers, you, well, you, 
You say I can't take three days off. I say he took more than three days off to go deer hunting. He took three days off to go fishing. Why can't you pastors set the standard and say there's going to be a meeting for pastors at least one day a week or one night a week when we get together, we evangelicals really lay hold of God for revival in our city. These kids around here will raise money to go to Hong Kong for three days or go to South America, but when they come back, as soon as they get off the plane, their compassion dies. Well, what are you going to do with kids like that? And they'll keep doing it as long as we want them. You know, oh, we took a number of our people from our church. We took them on a cruise. But you're touching the elite of the church all the time. You've done that year after year, and the poor people are struggling. If you can take six or seven days off for a cruise, can you take six or seven days off for a nation that's going to hell? What do you want to do? Kids lie in the street fornicating? People clobbering a man on the head and stealing his watch? That's sin to become before your eyes, before we feel. I mean, how many... It's all right to say, I want to be like Jesus. Do I want to be like... Do I want Gethsemane? I've never heard a person yet, dear brother, and I've gone to church for 80 years. I've heard men say I was born again, I went to the cross, so I've, had my, I've had my upper room experience. I've never heard a man say I get so many experience. I've broken. My dad was the nearest of that. My dad couldn't say grace at mealtime without tears. Right now I have invitations to seven different... I'm not going to one. I said, because if people say, what's happening in America? I can't say there's a revival anywhere I know. I said, do you think I'm going to talk to them about the Holy Ghost revival when we're dying and doomed and damned here? And we go running into worse trouble. Well, isn't there scriptures? What does God say? I can't give you glory because you honor one another. That's, right. That's one of the biggest sentences we have. Like John Wimber stood up, why don't you eulogize me? And I said, if you do, I'll walk off the platform. Well, I went to say, well, first of all, we talked about revival. He said, well, you, you told Bickle that in revival you don't make altar calls. I said, you don't. He said, I've never been in a meeting like that. So I said, when we come, I said, let our David speak an hour before I do an hour. Our David's free now. He's pulled out from a church. He's free to go anywhere. I, I said, so David preached an hour. We had a 15-minute break, and I preached for an hour and a half. And while I was preaching, the whole audience broke up. They came in hundreds to the front and wept and groaned and cried out audibly, make me clean, purify me. That happened six days. We never had three one week and three the next. We never had an altar call. We didn't have to. They came to the altar and stayed not five minutes, two and three hours calling on God. You read Luke chapter 3, what does it say? John was preaching and the people cried out, what should we do? And the soldiers cried out, what should we do? And the publicans cried out, dear God, when heathen men start crying out, what should we do? You know, God's there. There's no pleading altar calls. Oh, no, what did they say on the, on the, on the day of Pentecost? Men and brethren, what shall we do? We're panicking. We're, we're, the altar doesn't mean anything to people now. They come out every week. We're Romanizing our Protestant. Oh, get your sins forgiven and go back and do the same lousy thing. It's ridiculous. You don't do that if you go to death. When you die to self, you die to business promotion, you die to ambition, you lay it all out and say, we mean this with this, let God go on record, put us on record. We're not going to do anything unless we get there. We've had a, a kind of event. What do we have not long ago? Do you remember A.A. Allen? A.A. Allen used to have meetings. You get 500 come forward and on the way home to his hotel. He, he phoned his call girl and she met him there. He died with uh, liquor bottles, uh, whiskey bottles all around his room. There's a whole bunch of men done that. You don't find anything like that amongst the old-fashioned revivalists, true revivalists. That's why I, like, I write to read a book like uh, this one on uh, the accounts of revival. I mean, it's something we don't know a thing about, dear God, pity us. We say we have the same Bible, the same Holy Ghost. Why don't we get the same results? The menace of many of our meetings is we try to get people saved. They don't know they're lost. Come forward. The Lord loves you. The Lord loves you. The Lord hates you. Why do we put a stunk, instead of a bumper sticker, God loves you, God is angry with the wicked every day, or the wicked should be turned into hell, we'd soon be in trouble. Fools make a market sin. Yeah, but we don't do that, we don't even preach it.
But I know there's a hunger across America by the phone calls I get. And uh, guys are coming through a stone wall now. They, uh, there's, there, isn't a, there isn't a church in this town that's having a move of God, they say. And, uh, well, pray till there is, get together. And... Uh, The prophet Amos yeah. <clears throat> said, Behold, the days saith the Lord, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. Yes. Famine. Not a famine of bread, yeah. nor a thirst for water, but of hearing yeah. the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, hmm. and from the north even to the east they shall run to and fro, yeah. to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Hmm. Is that literally like no Bibles, or is it that the word isn't a living word? It doesn't. I mean, you can read it. I go and hear a fellow and he preaches. There's no passion. There's no tears. There's no, you know. I'd, I'd rather like Richard Baxter. I preached as if to never preach again, and as a dying man to dying men no. You think this fellow's a professional, he gets paid, and when he, when he steps out of the pulpit, he says, Hey, John, uh, what about a, a round of golf on Wednesday or Thursday? And immediately they switch from the spiritual and eternal to some stupid thing. I wouldn't take any notice of them anyhow. I'd say, Pastor, live it, live it, live it. Don't tell me to pray, meet with me in the, in the church. When I got saved, and then after I trusted God to sanctify me because of the blank in my life, and the first thing I went to the pastor said, Pastor, I want a prayer meeting on Wednesday night, on Friday night for the young people. Oh, well, it's not good for young people to meet together. So you come and supervise it. Do you think we're going to fall out? So we started a prayer meeting on Friday night at 7, and we prayed till 9. I started a prayer meeting at 7 Sunday morning, and I lived on outside the boundary of town. I walked to the prayer meeting, walked home for breakfast, walked home for the morning service, walked home for lunch, walked back for the afternoon service, walked home for supper, Worked for the nine service, night service, and God began to move, and people in the neighborhood got saved. That had never ha <coughs> happened before. But you see, once you've been in that, it's like, uh, like, uh, I'd say not, not Colonel Bringle, but Major Thomas said, no, Major uh, Russell that once he got back in the fire of the Welsh Revival, everything in him burned. He got on the train and going home, to, he couldn't get back to London quick enough to tell that the Holy Ghost had fallen. And then, I mean, the first greatest revival in England was the Wesleyan Revival that went to 90, no, the Wesleyan Revival. And then the next one was the Salvation Army, which that went into 70 countries in 90 years, not 70, but 70 countries. Dear God, they had the most amazing night prayer meetings and training students and getting down to the Bible and prayer. And every week they were taken to a night of prayer and they were taken to street meetings somewhere in London. They were meeting sin head on, and visiting taverns, talking to harlots, which nobody does know except just about Dave Wilson and, and Tim Delaney down in, uh, in the Motor City there doing the same thing. But we're, we're all sitting inside for our Ted John Wimber. I said, why do you sit inside a four wall singing, let the earth hear his voice? It doesn't make sense. Let the earth hear his voice. Get out. Stand on a box. Call a man to witness. Call a woman to witness. Sing a hymn. He can't preach very much to crowds. But before long, you say, we're going to be here every Saturday night for the next winter and, or, or summer. And they come with expectations to plan the shopping like people used to do with us. They plan to come shopping on Saturday, Friday night and Saturday night because we're in the town square. And hey, we didn't miss for three years. And our young people came. You didn't have to whip them. They came eagerly, you know, give them a chance to witness. I said, if anybody stands on this box who isn't telling the truth, you interrupt them because I'm the leader and I said, I'll check on them. Don't let a man talk when he's not walking it. If he's walking in it, if, he, if the man is in your factory, your office, uh, if they're not telling the truth, come and tell me, you know, chase them off. Well, we didn't need to advertise in the paper, dear God, I was the best known man in town. Even though the cathedral was only 300 yards away from us, magnificent cathedral. 
I only got 500 Sunday night. They stood outside and lined up like a movie house. But the cathedral got 50. So where do you go? I mean, the cathedral is ornate. It had gold plate on the... or gold uh, communion things and candlesticks on the altar. It, it was like a miniature Westminster Abbey, stained glass windows. But what is that to the glory of God? I mean, our place was packed an hour before time. Our prayer meetings were packed. We had three prayer meetings a week and three street meetings, and that's why that church kept in continuous revival for the three years I was there. And it's still there today. Well, brethren, what, what, what I want to say is that either the Bible is absolute or obsolete. Which is it? Is God all he says he is? Is Hebrews 11.6 what we need to rediscover? He that cometh to God must believe that he is. What does it matter about swag and all the rest? I know it's, it's objectionable, it, it hurts. And people are, tell me now, they're already cracking jokes about swag. If, uh, if God told me he could go on preaching, a guy told me the other night, somebody said, well, if God says he can go on preaching the message, then why didn't God tell him there's a cop following him out the road in a car? So, the mother's dumb as they appear to be. I think it all boils down to one of the oldest hymns where we hardly ever sing it. Trust and obey. There's no other way. No other way. It's hard on the flesh. It's hard against the lifestyle of preachers round about us, but what does God want? I'm not going to the judgment bar of the Assemblies of God or the First Baptist Church. I'm going to the, I'm going to the judgment bar of Jesus Christ. And I live with that every day. It's his words that will judge us. Yes. That's what he said. Well, you think we're going to... It's not what's just in the book of life, as Tosa said to me one day, he said, Leonard, I don't think I'm ashamed of what I've done since I was saved. It's what I could have done that troubles me, and not what I did, but why I did it. God is going to weigh the motives. I mean, I had D. Camel Morgan say, I had talked with a friend of mine the other day, and he'd been preaching in a church I love to go to, Monk Camel Morgan said. How did he get on? He said, oh, he said, I enjoyed myself. He said, he did. He enjoyed his oratory. He enjoyed his rapport with the people. He enjoyed his eloquence. He enjoyed himself. What did God get? The, the question when I finish a meeting is, I didn't get anything out of this meeting. What did God get out of it? What do people say going out? I think, dear brother, if I was where God wants me to be where I should be, I would leave a meeting with tears running down my face at the glory of God or that all these people outside are glued to the TV this afternoon, this Sabbath day, and they're not a bit interesting, God. Christ could die on the main street today. It won't interest them at all. But we've got, I, I think we've got to preach till people know that we mean what we say. We burn... Edwin Hatch was... Uh, Chancellor of, uh, I think, St. Mary's Co Co College in Oxford, uh, one of the best guys in England. But one day, even though he had crowds and everything, he, he got so tired, he went in his office and he wrote that gorgeous hymn, Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew. Then the last time to breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine, till all this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. People ask me, how do you, you've been preaching 70 years now, how do you keep an edge? Because I read stories on revival, because I read the Word of God, and I see what the Apostle did, that Paul can laugh at death and laugh at hardship and sit in the lousiest prison in the world and tell other people to rejoice. Or he can give you 2 Corinthians 11 and go down seven times in fearlessness and the fasting, in perils of the deep, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils, perils, but enough to kill ten men and glory in tribulation, doesn't just find grace to get through, he welcomes it. He said, this is the only way. Because when we get to heaven, that dear brother, God is going to ask you where your diploma is, he's not looking for medals, he's looking for scars. 
Paul says, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Yeah. Because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, yeah. but as it is in truth the word of God, yeah. which effectually worketh also in ye that believe. Yes. Do men not believe this word that has been written to them? Well, because it doesn't work in us. I say, you stand in the pulpit and preach it, but what does it mean to you? Why does it work out in your life? I mean, you have to drive the biggest car, you have to have this, you have to have the other. I have a five-year-old uh, uh, Lincoln Continental, the small one, you know, now people laugh at me for having it. I say, well, I'd swap it for anything else. It's reliable, that's why I like it. I got it because I'm doing long-distance traveling. I don't need it to shop in. If you want to buy it, buy it. I'll take an older one. But I, say it's got, I said, it doesn't mean that much to me. I said, I haven't, I haven't bought any clothes for five years. I've bought one pair of trousers. I, I, it's just that I used to almost idolize clothes because I was, I was a tailor before I was, uh, before I was saying I wore the best clothes in the country. In fact, they used to call me the best dressed man in the whole world. But all that's gone, that's trivial, that's silly looking back. I said, all that matters, if you can get nearer to God than I get, tell me how did you get there. That's all I'm concerned about. Paul isn't concerned about anything. I said, you go to the national convention of your denomination and stand up and say, I've got a glorious text for you. There's a thousand pastors here from our denomination. I've got a glorious text from you. You're dead. What would they do? They'd glare at you. I said, Paul could. You're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Oh, they believe you're dead. You preach as though you're dead. You act as though you're dead. But are you dead to all the world's glamour? Are you dead to the rivalry in your denomination? Are you dead to climbing up the ladder? They tell me preachers wept when, uh, when Criswell finally decided to have jo Joel Gregory from Travis Avenue as his assistant. Other men thought, well, I deserve it after him. True, it was there 45 years. He's been there 42 years. I'm a young man. I should go in. So what? People ask me, what do you do to be great? And I wash somebody's feet. Was A.W. Tozer your mentor? Yes. What was he like? Well, there were different ways to answer that question, but I'll tell you one thing about him. Uh, it was the same with uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones. I talked with him. G. Campbell Morgan, I listened to him often. So, Martin Lloyd-Jones and George... Uh, Campbell Morgan and Tozer had one thing in common when they went to the pulpit they never raised a finger never raised a voice they didn't depend on histrionics to get the message of Dr. Tozer had a habit of uh, like he'd have his uh, he'd have his Bible in his hand say I'm reading from John 17 1, and he begin to read and, and he'd maybe give a little outline and, and then he, he rocked to and fro like this then Suddenly, he threw his Bible on the pulpit, and at that moment, he was airborne. It's like a, like a plane getting off the runway, and off he went. And uh, he wasn't the greatest preacher I've heard in my life, but he had the most uh, intimacy with God. Uh, uh, like he read all the mystics, you know, you could quote Ladder of Sanctity, or you could quote Madame Guillain or Faber, anybody. And he could put his finger on the whole lot and tell you how he'd read them. And uh, his, his emphasis was the inner man, the inner man, you know. And he was against showmanship. He wouldn't let anybody play a trumpet on his platform. Hardly let anybody sing unless they sang a hymn and knew who it was. And he had a fellow called um, Max something. Anyhow, he introduced, well, before that, Toza got an old Methodist head book and sold himself in it. Well, this fellow came on, and I can't remember his name, Mac, and he introduced him and they got uh, a lot of old Methodist hymn books, so they printed the sheets and they sang hymns like, and can it be that I should gain and all those? And um, Toza reveled in that kind of thing. He wouldn't have a concert in the place. 
He wouldn't have any uh, special meetings. I went, and we had two weeks, three weekends actually. And he said, "This is the greatest revival in the, in the history of this church." We had the altars open till midnight, people weeping and seeking God, and coming right across town. Well, here's the difference: you got Stu you got Moody Bible Institute here, next door is Moody Church. The students only had to come out of here into there, and yet they crossed the town when when the ice, you know, churned up by the cars and it froze. And you could, well, the people's ankles were snapping getting off buses. And the, the, they'd rather come across town in a car or walk, some of them, and hear Tosa than go next door to hear the, um, whoever was preached at that, Logsdon, part of the time. And, and uh, well, I'll tell you where he was. He was in that place that three times they begged him to become the president of the Christian Mission Alliance, when everybody wants that, he turned it down again and again. God didn't ask me to kiss babies and sit in council meetings. My business is the Word of God. And he, he would turn men away and not even... Uh, but he was a miser with his time. I, I was privileged to spend a lot of time with him and go to his home even. But all the time, he, he talked about, well, the type of teaching that uh, A.B. Simpson had opening the depths of the Word of God, you know. Uh, Romans and Ephesians living in that area and uh, shut worldliness out, shut theatres out, shut everything else which he did. He loved music. He, was, he listened every night to a recording of... Uh, of uh, who did he listen to? Not Chopin, I'm not sure, but... Uh, And I would have got symphony. Every night I had one hour listening to uh, good music. But again, he was. I prayed with him many times. Very, very wonderful in prayer. He didn't shout. He just he had a conversational talk with God. And uh, he could be. He could cut an audience in two with a word almost. Uh, he got very sarcastic at times. And, uh, you know, people kind of remonstrated with him for that. He refused all invitations until the very end. He stayed in one church 25 years and he didn't get a very big salary, so... His strength actually was his devotional life. He, he wouldn't let any, anybody trespass on that. He spent certain time with God all the time. Did you reflect some on your on your times with Keith Green? Well, Keith was a zealot. I mean, he he, he bounced through that door. I remember he well, I, where this division is. It used to be a wall, and Dave Wilkinson pulled it out and furnished all this for me, and. Uh, Wilkinson would come one day, Cream would come the other, as opposite as could be, because David was mature, he'd been a pastor for about 20 years then. Keith, of course, had come from the guts, and he'd tell me about his past life and sordidness, but he was hungry for God. I remember definitely a turn in his life when I told him he shouldn't charge to go into concerts, when they didn't do, they'd gone back to it this last week, I think, but they didn't do that. And uh, I remember talking to him about eternity on one occasion, and holiness on another, and he, he, you know, like a trout jumping up to get a fly, he got over it like that. And, and he would come back. I remember he bounced through the door, he didn't know, he, got, he wanted to get through it before he opened it, opened it, and bounced through, and there's a big guy. And he, I remember he used to give me pops and give me a hug. And he said, Pops, he said, do you know what all roads lead to? We used to say, in England, all roads lead to Rome. It's an old saying. Everybody travels to Rome to see. He said, do you know where all roads lead to? I said, no, they're sending. No, he said, you're wrong. I said, why? He said, all roads lead to the judgment seat. <laughs> I said, very good. And he had a... I don't know, I, I've never read this anywhere, but I think it's right to say he had a holy fever, or if you, if you like, a fear of God. I mean, when you think he didn't live very long, but I still get letters about him again. That book that his wife wrote on uh, no compromises, doing good. 
and uh, they still send his tapes out. In fact, he wrote the, he wrote the uh, Catholic Chronicles that they withdrew. Somebody wrote to me this week and asked me, could they have a set? Because God used it tremendously, but it got them into trouble for not being friendly enough with the Catholics, so they withdrew it. But, uh, and he loved to pray. He'd say, can we pray? And he'd get down and really pour his heart out, you know. And he had visions of what God wanted to do in this area. And he was... Because other people couldn't keep up with him. They thought he... Maybe he was... He wasn't mature enough, to, in one sense, for leadership. I mean, you know, want everybody to jump up to his level, which you can't do any more than I could jump up now to the level of a, an Olympic runner. I'm not, I used to run. I'd like to run, but I can't. I'm glad even to walk. But he was like that. I mean, he, he saw eternal things. And if, if they weren't clear to you, he couldn't understand your stupidity. He couldn't understand why you're not leaping and, you know, and going full pace. If he fasted, he fasted. If he prayed, he prayed. There's a uniqueness as well. My, my precious wife has a tremendous insight to people. The first time she saw him, she said, Len, uh, the Spirit of God is on that young man. And... Uh, in England, you, you know, you've got two kidneys as opposed to match, function the same. Well, in England, they say, well, that man isn't your kidney. In other words, you know, it's not your, if you want to call it, alter ego, what you want to call it. But immediately he came in, she said, well, there's something unique about, uh, and there was about him. And, and they don't have it now, they know that. I mean, he, he was willing to live at full stretch. He expected others to do the same thing for him. But, He was a good reader. He liked to read Tozer very much, and uh, he liked to read David Brainerd. Or he liked to read the three volumes of um, Edward Pace, and he read that too. In, in, in essence, dear brother, he's saying exactly what you say. Go back to the old past. He'd ask me why. Well, I, of course, he and the guy that used to be up at, uh, at uh, uh, up the street at the, um, we had a minister up there, Agape. Agape. They very much fashioned them. They used to read William Booth. They read the stories of William Booth and the old men. And he'd come to me and tell me more about Booth. Tell me more about the nights of prayer. Tell me about the days of fasting. Tell me about your street meetings. And... Uh, and he'd warm up to it, you know, we want to get back to that. And, uh, it's one of those mysteries, you don't know why God moves men along like that, but anyhow. How, Brother Ravenel, how would, how would you want people to remember you? Oh, I don't know. As a nuisance, I think. When your reward is like, uh, I can't do it now because I get so many people, but say three or four years ago, man, I come and spent two hours and then write back and say, you know, from another country, I'm pastoring out in New Zealand and the turning point was when I came to see you, I got more in two hours with you than I got two years in seminary. I'm reading the whole armor of God. I'm reading this, that. I'm reading some history of the Salvation Army and, and areas that they hadn't broken into. And uh, all I know is I've stressed as much as possible the, the life of prayer and personal devotion. Immediately you get cold there, you get cold outside. If you keep fueling yourself, you keep reading Isaiah 6 over and get visions of God and visions of a living the book of the Revelation and uh, you don't understand all of it, you don't ask to. I say God can't be explained, he can be experienced. And that's all that matters. I mean, I sometimes fear, like I preached my heart out on Sunday in a 3-4 vision, I wondered after, am I trying to get people to come up to the altar? I don't know, because I never made an altar go. But uh, nobody's going to jump. I mean, I got saved at 14, I'm 84, almost 85. So I've been seven, 70 years, I've seen all kinds of tragedies in the church, wars and rumors of wars, popular men going popular and so forth. But keep looking up to Jesus and reading the Word, and remembering these old paths that my daddy used to talk about so much, and all the other looks like trivia. 
guys now laugh at me because I, I live on my social security. I've, I've, I've done counseling in this room for 13 years and the whole aggregate, somebody leaves something behind. It's okay. They haven't left $500 in 13 years. So I don't do it for the money. A man called me from Houston <coughs> last year and he said, can I come and see you? I said, yes. Next one, a van came. Ten of them came with the pastor at 10 o'clock and they stayed till one night, taught my heart out as much as I could. Going out with them, I said, you don't, you don't expect any remuneration for this, do you? I said, no, I said, I live on my social security. Anything above that, I divided the middle between my missionary son and myself or the other boy. So this fellow said, well, we should leave you something. So he goes to the door, takes his billfold out, takes something out, and he came back and he, he put it on the table, put his hand on it, and he said, uh, I'm leaving this for you because I know you'll share it with your son. I said, I sure will. So they went, and I went to Martha, and I said, darling, they've gone now. I said, but they left us some money. Isn't that a miracle? She said, well, that, we don't get that. I said, well, I don't know what it is. Maybe a hundred dollars or a thousand he's left us because I told we share it with Paul. She said, well, let's go. So he came in. He left us five dollars. I said, well, one thing, we won't get drunk anyhow. No, I'm just saying that because everything has money in, it in America, you know. Well, what annoys me, well, what would it, how much would it cost to have you come for a week? I say, if you start that way, I'm not even going, I don't go. No, I think that, I think we're moving now. In one thing, it's terrible that things like uh, swaggers happen and so forth, but it gives the church a new start. We're going to start on a new level of holiness. We're not going to be entertainers. We're not going to bother who comes or don't come. We don't have to join in every effort that they're making the city to have a revival. Forget it, we've been doing that for 20 years. Stay at the place of prayer. It doesn't matter who comes to town to preach. We're going to stay together and pray Friday night from 9 till 11 and 9 to 12. I've done that always. Every city I've been in, I've started a pastor's prayer meeting. Usually on a Monday when they're washed out and tired. And they come from all denominations. There's no alternative to prayer. and obedience.